everyone, and welcome to another of our Impact International Safety Calls. We're, uh, we're thrilled to have you here with us this morning. A lot going on in the, in the world of safety for iron worker and men and women. And uh, the subject we're going to be talking about this morning is certainly something that I believe is pertinent to no matter uh, what trade someone might be in or whether you're tying rebar, erecting steel, doing curtain wall, whatever it may be. Um, we're going to be talking today about accelerated work schedules, and uh, we're seeing them seem to be increasing on jobs and, and what they're demanding of, of iron workers and other tradespeople out there to where it's getting to where jobs are, are working 710s, sometimes even 712s. And we're really beginning to see fatigue set in, uh, things that are, are affecting the health and safety of iron workers, uh, men and women out there. So. Along with that, we're going to lead into things discussing uh, tool tethering and other things that we're beginning to see that that are being used by uh, some con controlling contractors and some owners to uh, to aggressively push these schedules. So as always, um, we're looking forward to your questions. We want to be able to answer them. You'll see down in the somewhere on your screen, usually on the bottom, there's a question and answer tab. I would ask that you use that. There's also a chat tab. Um, I'm not gonna be monitoring the chat tab, but if you certainly wanna use that to discuss things amongst yourself, you certainly can. But if you've got a question you'd like answered by our panel, uh, use that tab, please. Um, again, great panel we have. We have some guest speakers with us this morning. Uh, we have uh, the Steve Rank from the Safety Department, and uh, we have uh, with us uh, General President Eric Dean, who's gonna be our give a, a few words here as we open up. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna welcome Eric to, to our, our program. And Eric, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pete. And as always, I, I appreciate your, your dedication towards doing this every month along with our safety department. You guys are bringing a lot of value, whether it was COVID, whether it's industry-related issues, uh, and Steve's department, you know, they're on it. You know. And they don't just serve the union, they serve the employers. We intentionally, we used to have the safety department as a sole set of the iron workers union. We have intentionally moved them over through impact so they can serve both labor and management. So uh, to all of you that are joining the call, I appreciate you being here. Appreciate your daily dedication to the lives of members. So whether you're a labor leader, iron worker um, union rep, or a contractor, every one of you, has a responsibility to look after the interests of our men and women of our union. So the two subjects today are near and dear to my heart. Um, we talk about uh, falling objects. What's old is what's new. Iron workers have always worked aloft and above other building trades and above other iron workers. We've developed means and methods that were established erection procedures, whether it be for the structural steel, for rebar, for curtain wall, mist metals, you name it. What's changed is the interpretation by the regulatory agencies on what the means and methods are for doing a job safely. Historically, we used to lay out planks on steel erection jobs every two floors. We'd make sure that we were protecting the workers beneath us from falling bolts or objects and protecting the workers down below and the additional iron workers as we plumbed up and finished the erection of the building. It has since changed to where we try and deck as fast as possible those floors to offer that same protection. And then we get some crazy compliance directives out of federal OSHA and some of the states that say, you know what, you can erect iron as high as you want, as long as you're 100% tied off, but they're escaping the responsibility of protecting the workforce down below from falling objects. In addition, there are means and methods now to stop that, such as tool tethering and various things of that nature. So the issue for us is how do we comply with safety regulations, how do we do it in a safe manner, and how do we navigate steel erection primarily, but reinforcing and curtain wall erection that keeps the workforce safe on the job site, the workers, the other fellow tradespeople down below safe, and how do we do it in a way 
that uh, doesn't make the hazards that we're preventing greater than the hazards were there in the first place. I can tell you from tool tethering, my son's about a seven year iron worker now. On his very first job, tool tethers were required and he had his personal lanyard and seven tool tethers to work on some uh, penthouse iron around a perimeter to tie in the curtain wall. And he said, Dad, you know, things are getting tangled and twisted and snagged. And I know that that's going to be a subject today. So we just got to find out when the hazard is greater than the one that previously existed. And then the other one is this compressed schedule. We all know time is money. And we want to perform in the most profitable way for the owners, for our contractors who get those jobs. But these compressed schedules are wearing our members to the grind. They're grinding them to a ball. We are erecting major tonnage in the most compressed schedules we've ever seen today. We're working, as Pete said, seven days a week. There's only so much in the tank of any human being of amount of physical labor that they can do. There's known data and studies about the effectiveness, both from a safety standpoint and from a productivity standpoint. So we just need to figure out a way to be compliant and to get these jobs done in the expedited, expedited time. But what it does is it puts pressure on union halls to have this grundle, a large available workforce for one job, sometimes two and three times the normal amount of what was a steel erection uh, crew or curtain wall crew for, for, that, for that matter, or a reinforcing crew to get the work done in an inordinate amount of time. So I appreciate the subject matter experts that are gonna talk about these issues and how they affect not only the workforce, but you, the employer. And we, won't, we, won't, we don't wanna harm your safety record, but more importantly, we got human capital we gotta worry about. So uh, Pete and Steve, I thank you greatly for what you're gonna talk about today. And for the over 400 people who registered, I thank you for the daily task of keeping our members safe. I'll shut up and get out of the way and listen to the experts talk. Thank you very much. Appreciate you all. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's good to hear that uh, I love the unity we have from management to the union and in, in the idea of, of just what Eric said. We're seeing these compressed work schedules, what it's doing to the employees, uh, the human body can take just so much. So I, I reiterate exactly what Eric said, and uh, I'm looking forward to this topic and uh, the discussion that goes with it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, from the Iron Workers International Director of Safety and Training, Mr. Steve Rank. Steve uh, has a PowerPoint presentation, is going to walk us through this and introduce our guests coming up. So good morning, Steve. Good morning, Pete. And just to... Uh echo what General President Dean say. We appreciate all you do. You give a lot of time to this, to make this happen, to bring these issues to the table. So you're a great ho host, Pete, and we appreciate everything you do. Um, as you heard by General President Dean, he understands these safety issues very well. And so um, we appreciate his support in the safety department to address issues, whether the deadly dozen hazards or regulatory issues around the country. It doesn't take much time to uh, tee up the, the issue and he gets it. So appreciate all his support and things that we have to do to make our members safe on the project. So the topic today is um, accelerated work schedules, falling objects and tool tethering. And unfortunately, uh, struck buys is still remains one of the iron workers deadly dozen hazards. And as you can see here on the slide, Number eight, it's struck by injuries from falling objects, tools, and equipment. Unfortunately, um, I regret that we lost a member this year due to a struck by incident. Was no fault of our own, but another construction trade on the project um, uh, dropped something, misrigged something, and it came down and killed our member. So it's very near and dear to us, and we want to address this. Uh, within our organization and also work with our partners out there on the job site, the project owners, the general contractors, and our contractors to address these, these issues. And struck by still remains one of the four leading causes of construction fatalities. That has not changed in 30 years, 40 years. It's falls, 
struck by, caught between, and electric, electrical. So as we go through this today, you can see these job sites, uh, some simple examples where we have to take steps to make sure that we can eliminate and abate these hazards on the project. Before we get started though, I wanted to uh, um, um, introduce the safety department we have with us today. We have Wayne Chrisup, the district safety representative based in New London, Ohio. We have Jeff Norris, a Canadian safety connect coordinator. Uh, he's, uh, his office is in Alberta. And supporting all of us is Christy Rose, United States Administration for the Safety Department, and also uh, Sandy Lastuska. She's the Canadian uh, Administration Assistant that helps us and Jeff throughout Canada. So when you see these names and folks, this is who the Safety Department is. At the bottom, you'll see where you can contact us. At the very last slide today, you'll see our new contact uh, number an email address where you can contact us 24 seven and one of us will get back to you immediately. We have two guest speakers today. We have Rusty Brown, the environmental health and safety director for Kiwit Power Constructors. That's gonna talk about him being a, a builder with multi-trades under their employment. They have to deal with falling objects, not only with the iron workers, but all the other trades that they have thousands of as their employees. So he's going to address this from his perspective. And also with us today is Tony Hannon. He's a corporate safety director for Shuff Steel. He's going to be coming at this from a perspective of, of dealing with serious issues on multiple projects, dealing with accelerated work schedules, trade stacking, people coming underneath us. So Tony's going to give us a lot of real life examples of situations he's been in and how to best handle them. So we're really pleased that both of these gentlemen are with us today. So here's just a, a brief overview of the topics we're gonna to discuss today, and we want your input. I see we already have some questions for the audience, so Pete, Wayne, Jeff, Christy, please interrupt us at any time if there's any questions on any of these slides, because we want to reach out and share these questions with the audience. First thing is the OSHA standards. What OSHA standards apply to falling object protection, not only from the employer and the steel director, but also for controlling contractors. We're gonna take a look at those. Project trends, as General President Dean mentioned, the new trend of using tool tethering for all wire iron workers, all tools and activities. We're gonna talk about that. Compliance issues. Tool tethering is no substitute for complying with controlling contractor requirements. We're gonna take a look at that. Lessons learned on all these situations we're gonna to discuss today. Accelerated work schedules mandated by project owners and controlling contractors, which has been the root cause of many of the serious incidents that we've read in the news on a lot of mega projects across the nation. Um, that accelerated work schedules was a common thread with all these serious fatalities and incidents. Then we're gonna talk about the roles of supervision. Who on your job site working for your, uh, under your employment is going to take the right corrective action when trades are coming in underneath us during the steel erection process or if we have falling object hazards. So the roles of supervision, we have to entrust with them that not only do they know how to erect the buildings, but they have to know the standards that apply and also their roles and responsibilities as supervisors in the workplace. Earlier this year, Pete hosted uh, one of these national safety calls that dealt with specifically the roles and responsibilities of supervisors in the workplace. And I just gotta say one thing, by a court of law, by OSHA and the National Labor Relations Board, foremen, general foremen and superintendents are not considered to be iron workers out of local one Chicago or 396 St. Louis or wherever. They're considered to be company management representatives. Why? Because they've determined over 30, 40 years that they are acting in the interest of the employer handling workers under their supervision. So therefore, roles of supervision play a very important role in what we're talking about today. So please, uh, uh, 
submit any questions that you have. Also, written notifications, how do you respond and notifications to general contractors or others that are treading on our turf, working beneath our steel erection activities, and so how do we respond to that? I'm sure Rusty and Tony will weigh in heavily on that. So let's take a look at just some of the basic falling object standards that we all have to comply with. Here's one that deals specifically with the employer. In this case, it could be a Pete Hayes that's securing loose items aloft, all materials, equipment, and tools which are not in use while aloft shall be secured against accidental displacement. And below this, I put the preamble. So if you wanted any more ex explanation as to the, 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 the intent of the standard, you see it right on your, on your screen. But this opens up a whole different issue. Take a look at the picture on the left, okay? You see the connector there has his beater next to his left boot, okay? You see he has a bucket of bolts up ahead, uh, up above him that's tied off. The question that's coming up on the job site is, is that beater in use and should that beater be tied off using a tool tether? Yes or no? What does the standard say? We just read the standard says it, you have to secure them if they're not being used. So the issue is in this particular instance, is this tool in use? Our, our answer is yes. But how do we articulate that and explain that to a safety person working on the behalf of a project owner or controlling contractor, okay? Look at the picture on the right. Typical connector, look at his tool scabbard. It's got a sleeve bar, it's got his spud wrenches in there. Does that constitute a falling object hazard, yes or no? Is that tool being used or should it be tied off because he doesn't have his hand on it, pulling it out, ready to stab it in a hole and make that beam to calm connection? That's the second issue we gotta keep in mind as we move forward here today. Two basic common situations. Next, don't forget the planking of floor openings. It's one of the first lines of defense, all right? You can put tools, materials on it, but as you come up multi-tiered buildings, you have to take some measures to prevent falling objects to people, other trades below you. Common practice we cannot overlook right here. So now let's get into a more specific standard on, that pertains to falling objects, and that is this. When we re rewrote the subpart R steel erection standards under negotiated rulemaking, because our organization, the Iron Workers International, and back then the NEA, the National Rector Association, pushed the Department of Labor to allow us to sit at the table to write the new steel erection standards. And one of the issues that came up is we have no control over people that work below us. So the committee, the CENRAC committee, developed this standard here, which says the controlling contractor shall bar other construction processes below steel erection unless overhead protection is provided below, okay? Now, if you wanna read more about that, here's the preamble to this. And the issue has been this. Does this standard say that the steel rector has the responsibility of putting up barricades? Does it say that the steel rector has to make sure that people aren't, they have to take measures to make sure people don't walk underneath us? No, it doesn't. Look at the standard, look at the preamble, and know that this is a controlling contractor requirement, that they shall bar other trades beneath us, okay? And this is something that Tony's gonna to speak to later, and unfortunately he's had a lot of issues with on previous projects. So here are common situations that we're gonna talk about where our work area on left and right, as you'll see here, we're maintaining a tightly planked in deck, there's no other trades beneath us, and yet we've used large nets to comply with this, the standard of maintaining a tightly planked or netted floor every two floors or 30 feet. However, one thing we gotta keep in mind is, is these fall protection nets are not debris nets, okay? It'll, it'll, it'll catch a come along, it'll catch some big tools that may not fall between the three inch by three inch netting, but what about the smaller stuff? What about bullpens, spud wrenches, things like this that could fall through there? So we gotta keep this in mind too. But these two pictures here are common situations where we need the cooperation out of the controlling contractor 
not to bring other trades up there when we're doing this work activity. Same thing that goes here. We're erecting iron. Yes, there are standards about pre-planning routes to make sure that no employees are, are required to work beneath these suspended loads, except for the iron workers that are hooking and unhooking the load. That's the only exception that we have here, okay? But in the case to the left here, we, got, we need the cooperation to keep people off of this deck, this erection floor, to prevent falling object hazards. And as you can see, this deck is tightly, tightly decked. So that's the first line of defense on falling objects. Is this picture to the left, a tightly planked and decked floor. It's one of the best first lines of defense to protect workers in the workplace. And this is just enough to wet your beak because we're gonna get into this more with our guest speakers. But here's is the, the trend going on, tool tethering. It's not a substitute for complying with the falling object standard and barring other people to know beneath the steel record process. And here's a trending issue. Some projects have asserted that tool tethering can be a substitute for complying with the OSHA standard that prohibits all construction closed Not true. Do not fall into this trap. It is not a substitute. You can do both, but you can't take away not complying with the standard. Any questions so far? So yeah, Steve, we've got some here. Um, the first one I could probably tackle, Todd asks, uh, contractor participation is required for any falling object pro program. What language should he use in our proposals to protect ourselves? Well, Todd, we can't give you legal advice here, but I can tell you that uh, we're gonna see more and more of this passed down to subcontractors and others on the job, language uh, in pre-bid scopes and in contracts that pushes more of this onto us, which Steve has already talked about that really falls outside of what OSHA says. But um, I would say it's something that everyone needs to look into. Uh, what do you need to do to protect yourself? So reach out to your legal and do that. Um, he also talks about <clears throat> many GCs uh, think tethering is the answer because they don't want to participate in the costs. Again, something Steve's gonna, we're gonna discuss what's going on there. Um, Russell McCurry just throws out the standard. That's exactly what you've just talked about. The tools which are not in use shall be secured. It does not say while being used. So that is that language that can be a little bit gray. Like you, when you use the beater on the beam, is that tool being used or not at that point in time? And right. then one more here. Um, again, this is one that I think is kind of a gray zone, but it says, does the steel erector need to net or provide perimeter protection for other trades or the general public? Again, uh, many times that's project specific. And the answer can be a little gray, but Steve, what do you think of that? Is there anything in the standard or anything that, that says we ha that needs to be done? There's nothing in this in the standard that that requires us to protect uh, the public or entities that are outside the scope of the standard. We have to do our diligence and make sure that we do the decking, make sure that we tie off tools that are aloft that are not being used, okay? Then we have the controlling contractors have to bar people beneath us. But you're right, Pete, there are these situations of working on the perimeter of the building. If you're in downtown Minneapolis or Chicago, what measures are gonna be taken to make sure that the perimeter protection, I know Rusty and Tony are gonna get involved into this heavily here in a few minutes, is perimeter protection. We agree that tying off everything when we're working on a float, putting 48 bolts in a splice plate in these tree columns will require us tying off these tools and everything else, okay? But then we're gonna talk about to the interior of the building and what's those differences and what considerations should be uh, uh, addressed to bifurcate the exterior of the building, public exposures versus, versus interior of the building with a tightly planked deck floor where you don't have that exposure. So that's what we have to communicate with our customers, our general contractors. Hopefully they'll bi bifurcate that, not paint us with one broad brush that you gotta do it all the time no matter what, okay? Thanks, Pete, for those questions. Anything else on the list at this time? Uh, looks like one just popped in. It looks like a Canadian question. 
Okay. Um, maybe uh, Jeff would like to tackle that one. Jeff, if you can, you can, it says Canadian contractors are in a bit of a pickle. Our provincial regulations do not have a subpart R or similar type of regulation that specifically calls out the process of steel erection. Yeah, um, thanks, Pete. Well, currently in Canada, OHS is regulated under a variety of mechanisms across the country, acts, regulations, standards, guidelines, codes. So through these instruments, uh, essentially, 14 different jurisdictions across uh, the country of Canada. So uh, the, 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 the answer to that question is it's regional. And so we don't have a federal standard other than, um, than the, the, the federal standard for government projects, for example. Um, but, but the following object uh, topic, industry is pushing for legislation requiring workplaces to implement a drop object programming. And that does include uh, tool tethering processes. So uh, what we're probably going to do with this topic is we're going to regionalize it to each province uh, with our lunch and learns. So um, I would ask that caller uh, to uh, stay tuned for a lunch and learn in their jurisdiction. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Looks like yeah. that's, uh, that's it for now, Steve. Great. And thanks for your question there, Russell. Hey, uh, Steve, I've yeah. got one that came in on the, this is Wayne. I have one that came in under the chat. Uh, it reads uh, from Chris, it reads, I have seen where tethering has been more hazardous to workers and iron workers. Has this looked at or been discussed uh, being added into subpart R? So that would okay. necessitate reopening the standard, Steve. You want to? Right. No, it has never been discussed or even proposed to add to subpart R. To do that, you'd have to open up the whole standard and go through a whole rulemaking process, okay? Uh, I think that the best bet is to use it on a case-by-case -case issue where it requires this uh, tool tethering to protect pedestrians or in cases where this is the best method of protection, we're gonna use it, okay? But I wouldn't want it to be a standard and to talk about the greater hazard situations and without getting into any specific incidents, Yes, we have had incidents regarding tool tethers snagging and hanging up on things and causing our iron workers to fall. It wasn't the lack of fall protection that made them fall. It was the fact that their tool tether lanyard got snagged on something and jerked them back and that caused the fall. Okay, so we have to be very careful about mandating 100% of anything. There's always going to be certain situations where this one particular tool or piece of equipment may not be the best choice. So we got to have safety people in here, like all you fine people and Russell out there and the rest of you to, to evaluate when you need to use the safety equipment and when is it not required, okay? I hope that answered the question. So with us today, our first uh, guest speaker is Rusty Brown from Kansas City, home in the Kansas City Chiefs. And he's gonna share with us today his project uh, policies and procedures and his successes with falling ob object protection with having multiple trades under their employment from Kiwit. They do mega projects throughout the nation. They have literally thousands of employees under their direct employment. So he's gonna talk about falling object protections as well as considerations for tool tethering. So everyone, please welcome Rusty Brown. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> hey, uh, first of all, just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, tool tethering. Um, you know, tool tethering to us uh, is not a substitute for working under iron workers. So when we're doing steel erection, uh, we do not allow people to, to work stacked or staggered uh, in those systems. Uh, a couple things come to mind there. One is uh, scheduling your work. Uh, making sure that you know we're not around the iron workers as they're erecting steel, um, nuts and bolts and things like that. You can't tie those things off. Uh, whether you put debris nets or not up um, is is a question. But the best thing is to put an exclusion zone. So the second thing is setting that exclusion zone. An exclusion zone doesn't mean red tape. That's a physical barrier that needs to be uh, erected around 
the zone where the iron workers are working. Um, the other thing I want to make a point to is uh, tool tethers are not needed when, uh, there's three things there. One, you're an arm's length uh, from the edge. Um, two, that uh, you have a fully decked or planked uh, surface. And three, uh, the handrail is guarded to the midrail. So you have to have all three things there. Again, at arm's length, uh, so I'm six foot five, so an arm's length is uh, a three and a half feet, um, and then fully decked and planked, and then the handrails guarded to the midrail. Uh, we've been asked uh, several times, how did we come up with uh, uh, having the, the uh, uh, handrail guarded to the midrail? Where did that come from? Well, it came from several studies that we did. Uh, we looked at different uh, ways that uh, things were uh, leaving elevation. Uh, so we basically did a bunch of studies and we found that guarding to the mid rail and not to the top rail, uh, most items uh, were stopped at the tow board level and then some items went uh, to the, the uh, top of the mid rail, but we did not have anything go between the mid rail and the top rail. Not to say that could never happen, uh, but if you're an arm's length back, uh, the, the risk potential is, has been greatly reduced to, uh, to a one. And uh, so that's, that's how we came up with, with that particular rule. Um, the last thing uh, that I wanted to just stress, and this is something that I've seen, you know, several of the pictures even in the presentation, is we've been pushing the manufacturers for tool tether anchorage points. Um, all too often we find when we do have a drop tool uh, in our business, we see that it has been tethered. Uh, either the anchorage point failed or the tether itself failed. Uh, tethering in itself is not uh, something that we go to immediately and say, well, this is gonna save all of our workers. There's a lot of other engineering controls that you can use and tool tethering like PPE is the last resort, not the first. So we need to be very careful there uh, during uh, steel erection when we're working uh, with tool tethers. Yeah, this is a great example right here. As you can see, uh, the top right, um, this is a, an attachment that was put on uh, to, to the tool. And if the manufacturer provided a, uh, a tether point like the, the beater there in the, in the middle, uh, you're a lot, you have a lot less chance of human error coming into play. Uh, the uh, the uh, tool at the bottom left, as you can see, uh, if the manufacturer provided a spot for anchorage point, uh, that particular tool tether in itself, in our, uh, in our experience, as you beat that tool uh, through on that pin, uh, sometimes you can strike that, that particular tool tether and that plastic piece break off. Uh, that either becomes loose or you hit, you hit or strike that nylon uh, and with, a, with your beater and then it just completely becomes uh, detached fr uh, from your, your tool uh, pouch or, or to your wristlets. So we have to push the manufacturers to provide um, anchorage points for our tools. And we've been working with a lot of manufacturers. Um, there's a myriad of them um, that we work with from DeWalt, Milwaukee. Um, we've, we've also worked uh, with Snap-on uh, hand tools and uh, within DeWalt and Milwaukee's uh, hand tool uh, line and power tool side as well. So uh, trying to change the industry versus just being another uh, player in the industry has is, is become kind of a mission of mine uh, to try to help people understand that we do have some, some problems in the industry. So again, tool tethering, last line of defense, not the first line of defense. Steve? Yeah, thanks, Rusty. Um, also, I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, this issue. I'm gonna page back up here. And this is an issue that General President Dean brought up, that the, one of the first basic staple requirements that's been an OSHA standard since 1971, okay, before you graduated from Warrensburg, Missouri Safety Department, Rusty, <laughs> okay? Just a couple years. But this standard here that says a fully planked deck or net shall be maintained within two floors or 30 feet, which is, is less directly under any erection being performed, okay? This was another standard that we wanted to have carried over from 1971 to the new subpart R steel erection standard that went to effect in 2001, okay?
okay? And in the preamble of that, it was OSHA's rationale that having this deck in provides falling object protections to, to iron workers and other construction trades on multi-story structures. We agree with this, and I know Kiwit does too. Kiwit would never erect a building looking like this, would you, Rusty, with no, no. decking, nothing. No, but, and it, what's interesting about, if you look at this particular uh, picture, what we found out is it actually, let's take the human error out of it for a minute, in this particular uh, picture, it actually costs us more to erect all the, the grading and the, and the floor decking when it's uh, installed like this. So typically what we do is we'll fly uh, sections up. Uh, so it would probably put a larger crane out and fly a whole section of decking up uh, with all the steel and everything uh, already intact. So uh, reducing our, our costs and our exposure. And when you have that full decking, whether it's grading or not, uh, if it's grading, you already have the uh, protection already put on the grading as it's flown yeah. up and, and put into place. Yeah. But thanks, uh, Rusty. But this has been an issue that is, continues to be a source of confusion, costly project delays, unnecessary litigation, and sadly, sadly, it's been a primary causation factor in fatalities and serious incidents. And don't think our organization has an approach to the Department of Labor on this, not once, not twice, but about nine times on formal meetings to show them, to explain to them that their compliance directive that you see right here, folks, and their interpretation letter is effectively removing protections for iron workers and other construction people on multi-tiered projects, period. They think by this letter and their compliance directive that a quote, 100% fall protection is a substitute for maintaining a tightly planked and deck floor every two floors and 30 feet, all right? It is absolutely not. It's creating more hazards in the workplace by this latest letter that came out from the director of the director of construction department where you see here that they're talking about the 1926-754-B3 standard that requires a tightly planked and decked or netted floor, saying here that in essence, okay, oh, well, you have to evaluate fall protection and we, we're gonna allow our, con, our compliance officers to make that decision when they get on a job site, whether uh, complying with the standard or 100% fall protection, it, it's gonna be their discretion. They don't have that discretion. We have a very specific rule uh, a line item standard that requires a tightly planked deck or netted floor in the story. There's no substitute for that. And, but yet this enforcement directive here, and you can see at the title, top of the title here, it says enforcement of steel erection subpart R. Okay. Whenever an agency says, this is the way we're going to interpret the standard and this is the way we're going to enforce it. When their interpretation and enforcement letters, crosses the way we do business, you better believe we're gonna be approaching them. And we have, and we're, we're, we're presently engaged with discussions right now to get the agency to finally rescind this, this, this misguided compliance directive that we can't have continue exist, okay? Now, if you want to tie off 100% at two feet, that's fine, but do not take away our decking. That's there for a platform for rescue. It's there for falling object protection and also limits falls and other things that, that could happen during the, the erection of multi-tiered buildings. So I know that both Shuff Steel today and Kiwit don't subscribe to these kind of underground rulemaking letters that effectively remove safety provisions for iron workers. Rusty, have you had anyone approach you and say, well, we have this letter of interpretation, so we don't think that we have to provide decking. Has this come up with, within your organization? No, it has not. That's probably because you have control of the whole site with direct hire of your iron workers and the way you're gonna uh, wreck the building and the, the project, correct? Correct. Okay. So we're really pleased to have some experienced people here, and this is yet another issue that's tied into the falling object issue that we cannot allow to have misinterpretation on. And we don't want any of our contractors here that are with us today, our local union people, to give any credibility to this letter that you see right here, okay? It has absolutely no legal standing in a court of law. It's an interpretation letter. It is not a standard, 
okay? And there's no justification in the standard or the preamble that would give the agency any kind of leeway to write this kind of, uh, of, of letter, okay? So we gotta be real clear on that when we talk about falling object hazards and these situations on these, on these buildings. And here's a close up of different common tool tethering devices that 